I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I've uh, participated in the uh, uh, sessions that 120 has sponsored over the years and have, have always enjoyed this. Uh, we're we're going to shift, I guess, from vertical construction in South America to horizontal construction in uh, the United States. And I want to share with you today um, what I found, based on some of my research, to be one of the earliest concrete pavement overlays that dates back to 1918. Um, and I thought this was uh, pretty significant because I think it, it helped demonstrate uh, the feasibility of the, the technique of the technology and maybe kind of help set the stage over the years. I did find some vague references to some earlier concrete overlays somewhere maybe around 1913, 1914, but couldn't track down as, uh, very many details. Uh, this one that I'm going to be featuring and sharing with you today was a little bit better documented. So uh, I, I just want to kind of share with you some of the things I found and, and uh, uh, give you a little bit of insight into how the, the pavement was constructed. And there will be a lot of black and white photos uh, featured in the, in the presentation here. So um, just as a quick outline, what I want to share with you today is just a quick discussion on concrete overlays. That'll be information familiar to most people. Then I want to share kind of the scene, what, what things look like back in 1918. And then I want to get into the specific concrete overlay project, talk a little bit about its impacts, and then a quick summary. So first of all, in terms of concrete overlays, if you've been involved in concrete pavement construction at all, you know that is it has been and continues to be a very significant segment of the paving market. It's a it's a segment that has seen some increased, some significant increased growth in the last probably 10, 15, 20 years or so. Um, no doubt because it offers a number of different um, benefits. Uh, the most sig significant one, perhaps, um, that's associated with all concrete pavement structures is it uh, provides a very long performance life, and it typically has very, very low maintenance requirements. It's suitable and capable of withstanding very high, high or heavy traffic loadings. It has a low life cycle costs. And something that we're starting to see uh, more emphasis here recently is some of the increased sustainability benefits. The fact that you're using a thinner concrete um, pavement structure in an overlay type situation means that there are some sustainability benefits from being from using reduced materials and the reduced virgin materials and so forth. Um, there's also safety aspects that are associated with uh, concrete pavement surfaces that uh, can, are considered a sustainable aspect because it uh, helps serve the, uh, the, the riders, the users of the facility. Uh, it also has uh, increased albedo or solar reflectance, which particularly in certain urban areas is being recognized as something that, that's very important. And it also can be used on basically any pavement and facility type, whether it's an existing concrete pavement, an existing asphalt pavement, whether it's a low volume urban street or whether it's a high volume urban freeway, um, it, it, it can, a concrete overlay can be used in any of those different types of applications. And as I mentioned, it does have a, a history of use to at least 1918. And again, I think there is some evidence to suggest that there is probably some projects that were constructed even prior to that. So let's take a quick look at what things were like in, in, in 1918. Um, at this point in time, we had seen a significant growth in the use of concrete pavements. Um, and this chart on the right hand side of the screen shows the growth from um, 1908, where it was maybe just uh, about a million or so square yards up to 1914, where it was almost 35, 34 million square yards, and it kept growing uh, thereafter. So some significant interest, uh, interest in the use of the technology, significant growth. But at this particular time, there really wasn't a lot of guidance or information on uh, the best way to design and construct concrete pavement structures. There wasn't a lot of information on really what kind of performance was would be expected with these types of structures, what type of maintenance or rehabilitation might be needed. 
Um, what guidance there was, there were several different uh, textbooks that were available. Um, There's a textbook on concrete roads and pavements that was published in 1913. Uh, the ACI developed some standard specs in 1914 that featured both one course pavement construction and also two course pavement construction. Um, the US Department of Agriculture of all, <laughs> of all agencies also published some guidance in 1915 on Portland cement concrete pavements. And then uh, the PCA also had a very short uh, flyer on the use of concrete highways that was published in 1916. So there was some information out there, but it, it was um, somewhat limited and it, its availability probably to the, to the entire uh, highway or pavement community in the mid 19 tens or 19 early 1920s or so was was probably very very limited but what was interesting was at this time you know the the highway engineers the local engineers had an interest in trying new techniques new procedures even though they didn't have a lot of guidance there was a very openness to trying some of these new materials new procedures to see what could potentially work for them in their particular situations so now I want to turn now to Terre Haute because this is where the this um, 1918 overlay project was constructed. So 1918 Terre Haute was a major transportation crossroads that was located in the west central part of Indiana, and you can see from the uh, the map there on the right hand side of the screen, it's located um, essentially just west of Indianapolis and slightly south. And at its particular location there, it was located on the Wabash River. So it was a, a, a hub that, that served not only uh, river transport being located on the Wabash River, it was also a hub for several major railroads. And it was also a major point where there was the fledging, fledgling road system was beginning to development to develop and kind of take shape. The National Road came through Terre Haute, which later became US 40. And there was also a major route, State Route 10, that came from Chicago, went through Terre Haute and down into uh, Kentucky, into the um, coal lands of Kentucky. And that was a major roadway um, that later became US 41. So there was, um, at that time in the road system, there was major interest in continuously maintaining that roadway network to try to meet the needs of the, uh, of the transportation system. So not only just to provide the transportation for uh, general population, but it also helped provide a mode of transportation to get the uh, goods from the, from the riverboat um, uh, transportation hub out to their points in the field, and also to get the goods and services from the railroads um, to, to provide them and to distribute those goods out to where they needed to be. So the roadway network really provided a number of different um, needs for that early age uh, in, in the nation's history. If we look at the particular project that we're looking at in, uh, in Terre Haute, it was State Route 10, as I mentioned, the major route between um, Chicago or up to Chicago and then down into the coal lands of Kentucky, major north-south roadway. The existing pavement at this time uh, was a nine inch, just described as a bituminous pavement that had been placed on the subgrade, 18 feet wide, but it had been subjected to significant traffic that had led to uh, its, its deterioration. Um, the county superintendent of roads, uh, his name was Ernest uh, Alta Cruz. He was somewhat of an innovator and he was interested in trying to try new technologies or new materials to try to come up with something that could withstand some of the heavy traffic loading. So he was the one who was interested in perhaps looking at concrete and instead of totally reconstruction, reconstructing this bituminous pavement, actually using concrete and placing it directly on top of that existing bituminous pavement structure. This particular segment of uh, 
route, State Route 10 was located uh, just actually outside of Terre Haute. And then the left hand shows where it's located, um, which would be the extension of 7th Street in, in Terre Haute. And it was a part that was really in far worse condition than some of the other segments of the roadway. So there was a need to do something to get that, that segment um, back up to a higher level of condition. And in the right-hand uh, photo of the screen shows where it's located today that the existing project obviously is not, is not still there, but this segment is, was located on 7th Street, which is now split by the uh, Interstate 70 that, that came through um, Terre Haute in the 1960s. So this segment of State Route 10 um, was looked at and they decided to try to come up with a, a concrete overlay solution for this particular project. They came up with a nominal three inch concrete thickness. It's not really clear how they came up with that. It almost seems like it was kind of a seat of the pants type of thing that they thought given the, the type of traffic and the condition that maybe three inches would, would uh, be sufficient. There were some parts of the project that saw slightly greater thicknesses in some of the settled areas. So they kind of used it to, to help kind of restore some of the grade and profile um, is essentially how I read that and also to provide a uniform surface. Um, at the time, it was deemed to use a, uh, a mesh reinforcement, about 48 pounds per 100 square feet, and to make sure that it had two and a half inches of cover. Well, if you do the math on that, uh, a three inch nominal concrete overlay with two and a half inch cover essentially puts that mesh reinforcement in the bottom third part of that, that slab. But mesh reinforcement was used very widely in some of the early concrete uh, pavements, um, recognizing that they saw a lot of cracking from some of these early concrete pavements, and they put the mesh in there, not necessarily to stop the cracking, but just to hold those cracks uh, very tightly together. They did put in 40-foot transverse expansion joints as part of this. So again, they recognized the need more from a constructability standpoint to put in these expansion joints. And they filled those with a material that they called elastite, which essentially was just a preformed uh, joint seal type material. It was constructed with the ACI standards of the day um, that again, as I mentioned earlier, were developed uh, based uh, by ACI in a, in a uh, 1914 publication. The mix design was a 1 to 1.5, 2.5, that's the cement, sand, and stone mixture with an inch and a quarter inch, uh, with a 1.25 inch maximum top size for that, that uh, aggregate used in the concrete. So actually a, a pretty good size top size material for that for that overlay. Interestingly, the work was done all by, by county forces. So they didn't have a, a contractor. They, they did it all internally using their, their county forces. Couple of photos here showing some of the uh, uh, processes that they went through. One of the very first things they did was to fill some of the depressed or some of the failed areas and they used concrete with that. And uh, evidently it didn't matter what your position was, you could go out there and if you had a top hat and a coat, you could still go out and uh, help and do some of the pre-overlay repair here. So very interesting photo showing some of the uh, prep work that was done on that existing bituminous pavement. After they did some of the early prep work, um, they basically cleaned the existing bituminous pavement, um, swept it off, cleaned it off, sprayed it with water. And then they placed a, a material called Tarvia XC. Tarvia essentially is a coal tar type material. And there were different grades um, of the, the coal tar. The uh, Tarvia XC was kind of a higher grade and it was meant to fill uh, some of the minor um, depressions and holes in the existing pavement. And then once it cooled, was meant to form a separation plane. So in essence, it was kind of serving as a, as a separator layer or what we would call as a debonding medium um, 
for what we would use in today's term when we're talking about an unbonded overlay. So in many cases, this probably could be assumed to be like an unbonded type of a concrete overlay. And the photo on the right-hand side shows the, the placement of the Tarvia XC being placed by, by hand. Uh, the, the next step then was to uh, place the steel reinforcement, and here they are placing the, the mesh reinforcement. Uh, and it looks like they had actually placed maybe a preliminary part of the concrete, and then they placed the mesh on top of that. Then they will follow up with another play, placement of concrete on top of that to essentially embed that, that mesh material. And you can see the, the mixer in the background there that has a long, uh, a long bucket. And that is how they distributed the concrete at various points um, within that particular slab. So each of these slabs was poured essentially at a 40 feet at a time. Remember we said it had 40 foot uh, transverse expansion joints. So they essentially poured each of these slabs singly at a time and they use the expansion joints as a way to kind of de determine the limits of each of their uh, their segments when they were when they were placing the concrete. After the placement of the mesh and then the, the top placement of the second layer of concrete, they finished it off with a screed board and then what they called a light metal roller to kind of provide um, some smoothness to the surface. And then the final step was just to use a canvas belt uh, that they work back and forth to kind of, again, help provide some overall smoothness and also to provide um, some, some surface texture to the surface, some, something to promote um, some, some surface friction so that you uh, wouldn't have skidding issues on the particular project. And in both of these figures on the left-hand side of the, the photos, you can see there was a trolley car track uh, that this roadway was built next to. And they used those trolley cars um, to help feed a lot of the, the construction. They used that to help bring a lot of the aggregate materials and other um, equipment and stuff that was needed as part of the, uh, the construction. And then this was interesting. This was their curing process. No curing compounds in 1918. They recognized the, the value of uh, wet curing. And the way that they accomplished the wet curing was they set up uh, little dikes and they ponded that concrete for up to eight days. Um, so they did, uh, looks like they brought in a lot of earth, um, maybe from some surrounding fields, or maybe it was just gravel from, um, some of the previous work that they had done. And they set up these little uh, dikes and then flooded the, the pavement to help provide wet curing. And then this is the best photo that I could find of the completed project. And I, I again, I kind of apologize, it's not that clear, but you can, if you look kind of closely, you can make out some of the, the uh, 40 foot slabs, you can kind of make out some of the transverse expansion joints there. And you can see then the trolley car tracks kind of in the background as well. So this was what the, the project uh, looked like then shortly after it was constructed. So the overall impacts of this pavement, um, it did help provide some guidance on con concrete resurfacing in the 1920s and 1930s, both ACI and PCI kind of jumped on this and there were several little pamphlets that were uh, produced and distributed to uh, not nationwide, but also they, they focused on a lot of municipalities, cities, counties, and so forth, because they saw that as a potential bigger market um, that they could, they could seek uh, for, for the use of concrete overlay. So there was some, some distribution of information and materials um, from this particular project. It also did help feed the construction of some similar overlays by other municipalities. Several are noted here, project in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, one in Toledo, Ohio, and another one in uh, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. So that's just a quick look at this 1918 concrete overlay. Um, 
just trying to uh, say that I think a lot of the the work that was done here did kind of help set the stage for some of the future work of, of concrete overlays. It helped demonstrate the, the constructability. Um, from the records I've been able to uncover, it sounds like it provided at least 10 years of performance with very, very minimal maintenance. Um, the only maintenance that it sound like was done was some, some joint sealing of those uh, transverse expansion joints were done uh, periodically. Um, this project um, was later incorporated into US 41 in 1926, um, but then later the, the entire US 41, I think sometime in the 1930s or so, was moved about a mile over to First Street. So there was a segment of it that was on US 41 that served traffic uh, but then later, all of US 41 was moved over to First Street to, to, to hit more of the downtown area of, of Terre Haute. So uh, again, as best as I can tell, it provided about 10 years of performance, and then I think it must have been replaced and removed um, some point uh, after that. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, to, to talk a little bit about this early concrete overlays. And if there is any, are any questions or if we have any time, I'd be, be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kurt. Um, if there are any questions, um, one of the questions was, is Kurt, do you have uh, any sense or a good feel for the typical axle loads uh, during this time frame? Um, I don't off the top of my head, but I'm thinking it might have been about 10,000 pounds was probably typical. Um, the other thing to keep in mind at this period, a lot of the, the uh, wheel loads were not pneumatic. They were solid, solid rubber. So you can imagine that those would, would take a, a much stronger toll on, on any pavement, concrete, concrete or, or not. So uh, um, but probably somewhere around 10,000 pounds would have been a, a typical value probably from that time. And I see a question on the cross fall. I assume you mean like a cross slope. Um, I don't know if there was, I mean, I, I know engineers, early engineers recognize the importance of having a cross slope um, on the pavement. I don't remember seeing that called out specifically. Um, a lot of the early projects used only about a 1% or maybe a, a half of a percent of, of a cross slope on some of those early projects, not like the 2% that's commonly used today. So I don't specifically have that information, but I would guess that there was probably a small nominal amount of a cross slope. 